as we've seen, vectors are quantities that have both magnitude and direction. And sometimes vectors are specified for you in terms of, well, you're given the magnitude and you're given angles that specify the direction for the vectors. But in the last section, we looked at vectors given to you in coordinates or components. So maybe you've got the vector 1, 2, 3 and the vector 4, 5, 6. And the question is, how would you find the angle between those two vectors given to you in terms of coordinates? It's not, uh, it turns out to be easier than you might expect. It involves something called the dot product. And once we're easily able to calculate angles between vectors, we'll talk about something called orthogonal projection. Orthogonal, there are, there are three words used in math that all mean the same thing, in, in some context anyway. Um, perpendicular, orthogonal, and normal. So we're going to look at orthogonal projection. So perpendicular projection, um, once we know what angles are, um, we're going to take a given vector and then take a, a non-zero vector that specifies a direction and break the first vector up into two pieces, um, one that's parallel to the directional vector and one that's perpendicular to it. So that'll be orthogonal projection. Orthogonal projection comes up fairly often in physics applications. So what's the problem? You've got two vectors and you want, and they're given to you in coordinates, so components. So you've got two vectors. You can you represent them by arrows starting at the same point. And then we're interested in how would you find this angle if you're given these vectors in coordinates? So I'll put the origin right here, and then I'll make this x1, y1. And this is x2, y2. And I'll, so I'll call this vector A. And I'll call this vector B. Um, so A is the vector given in coordinates. It's just x1, y1. B is the vector x2, y2. And what we'd like to know is in terms of x1 and x2, uh, x1, y1 and x2, y2, how do you find this angle between the vectors? Um, hopefully you remember from high school trigonometry the law of cosines. So if you complete this triangle, so, and in fact in vector terms, we'll take a look at this vector that goes from this point to this point, I'll call that vector C which is b minus a, so that c is the vector, well, it's, you can also think the displacement vector from x1, y1 to x2, y2, so it is x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1. All right, and then the law of cosines from high school. Hopefully you remember it. It says that this side squared, that the length of this side, I should be more careful, the length of this side squared equals the length of this side squared plus the length of that side squared minus two times the length of this side times the length of that side times the cosine of the angle theta. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the, the length of C, so the magnitude of C squared, equals the magnitude of a squared plus the magnitude of b squared minus two times the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle in between a and b. So here, where theta is the angle. Between a and b. I should have said before, this could be anywhere, theta, theta could be anywhere from, in radians, it could be zero to pi, so in, in degrees, and you know, we do calculus in radians, but you know, most people think better in degrees. It could be anywhere from zero degrees, where the, the vectors point in the same direction, to 180 degrees, where they point in opposite directions. Um, okay. So we have this, 
And then you start filling things in. The, the magnitude of c squared, this is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And then the magnitude of a squared is just x1 squared plus y1 squared. And I'm going to run into that, so I guess I'll erase it. Um, plus x2 squared plus y2 squared. Then minus 2, I'm going to leave this like this because it'll work out nicely times the cosine of the angle in between a and b. Square, square this stuff, so expand it. You get x2 squared minus 2x1 x2 plus x1 squared plus y2 squared minus 2y1 y2 plus y1 squared equals x1 squared plus y1 squared plus x2 squared plus y2 squared minus 2 times the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle in between. All right, that wasn't hard, but now you can cancel the, the x2 squared on both sides and the x1 squared on both sides and the y2 squared on both sides and the y1 squared on both sides. And you end up with minus 2 x1, x2 minus 2 y1, y2 equals minus 2 times the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle in between. And then, of course, we divide by minus 2. And you get x1, x2 plus y1, y2 equals the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle in between. Well, that's a nice formula. And enable, would enable us to find the angle theta. If you want to find the angle theta, you calculate this side. Divide by the magnitude of a and the magnitude of b, assuming they're not the zero vectors, so, so that those magnitudes aren't zero. And take the inverse cosine. It would give you the angle. Um, that is what we're going to do. But first, let me say something about what happens in R3. So this was in R2. What happens in R3? I'm not going to rederive it, but you can and use the law of cosines again. And what you find in R3, so you've got two vectors, A is x1, y1, z1, and B is x2, y2, z2. And what you find is that, oh, x1, x2, plus y1, y2, plus z1, z2, equals the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle in between a and b. So what is this side? Again, it's the, the you just take the product of the corresponding components and you add them together. Um, so we make a definition, we define definition. And you can do this, we do this in any RN definition. Um, suppose um, A equals A1 through AN. And um, yeah, and B equals B1 through BN are vectors in RN. Then the dot product. A and B. Or A with B. Of A and B. Is A, and you really do put this dot, you don't just write them beside each other, and you read this A dot B. It's, you just multiply corresponding components and you add. So it's a number. Understand this. This is important. Later we're going to have something called the cross product. And it will be very different. The, the cross product of two vectors will be a vector back. The dot product of two vectors is just this number. 
Um, all right. So you can do that. Why would you want to? Well, the dot product has lots of nice properties that you can prove, lots of algebraic properties that you can prove um, immediately just from this definition. You just write it down. So, I mean, I'll just list some of them. But the real reason we care about it is because of its relationship with angles. So some properties of the dot product. Um, it's commutative, so it doesn't matter which order you do take the dot product in. A dot B is B dot A. You might wonder if it's associative. It doesn't really make any sense. Associativity has two, would have two dot products in it. But if you take one dot product, you've got just a number, a scalar, so you wouldn't have another vector to take the dot product with. Um, there's, however, it certainly, dot product certainly, and it's trivial to show this, it distributes over addition. And you can pull scalars out, so one way people will say that the dot product is, well, either linear if you're fixing one of the vectors, or bilinear if you're looking at both components, but you can pull scalars out, or extract scalars. If you have a scalar times A dotted with a scalar times B, you can just pull the scalars out. Multiply that times A dotted with B. Um, a vector dotted with itself. So suppose you take A as A1 through AN. When you dot the vector with itself, what do you get? Well, you're supposed to multiply the corresponding components and add. So you'll get each component squared, each coordinate squared, added together. So you'll get a1 squared plus a2 squared plus an squared. But that's the magnitude of a quantity squared. So that's important. a dotted with a is the magnitude of a squared. Then there's something called, this is more theoretically important. And I, I will mention one of the reasons why it's important in just a second. The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Um, I won't prove this for you. It is proved in the book. But it says that the absolute value of the dot product of two vectors is less than or equal to the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector. That's the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. You'll see why it's important in a, in a second. And then the only other property I want to mention right now is the one we just derived in R2 and the one I mentioned in R3 that how it relates to angles. This is how, this is the main importance of the dot product for us. A dotted with B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle in between A and B. So in particular what this says is if these aren't zero, so if A and B aren't the zero vector, so if A is unequal to the zero vector, B is unequal to the and B is unequal to the zero vector, then the angle between two vectors can be defined to as theta equals the inverse cosine of A dotted with B divided by the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B. All right, I said I would say why Cauchy, the Cauchy Schwartz inequality is important. In R2 and R3, I'm assuming Euclidean geometry and you derive the law of cosines in high school, you can show that A dotted with B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle in between. But dot product is defined in every Rn, in all Euclidean space of arbitrary dimension, where you don't have a preconceived notion of angle. And so you might ask yourself, well, what does angle even mean there? And then we do what mathematicians do. We, we kind of cheat. We, we use this to define the angle. So that the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, you prove without reference to any angles. You can just prove that this is true with the definition of dot product that we gave. But that means that if A and B aren't the zero vectors, then 
um, A dotted with B divided by the norm of A times the norm of B is between plus and minus 1. Right? If you divide this inequality by this side, you get the absolute values less than or equal to 1, which means that A dotted with B divided by the norm of A times the norm of B is between minus 1 and 1. Well, then you can take inverse cosine. You can take inverse cosine a number between minus 1 and 1, and we define the angle between the vectors to be the inverse cosine of that quantity. So, yeah, in R2 and R3, it matches what we can prove in Euclidean geometry in high school. In Rn, we use this to define what angles between vectors mean. All right. So, um, an easy example. Let's look at a quick example of how you use dot products. So let me write again that A dotted with B equals the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle in between. All right, so as an example, let's consider the three vectors, or three that I really want. A is 1, 2, 3. B is minus 2, minus 2, 2, and C is 0, 4, 1. 1, 2, 3, yes. All right. We'd like to say something about the angles between these three vectors. One thing that's easy to say without appealing to a calculator is whether the angles between the vectors are 90 degrees, so whether the vectors are perpendicular to each other. We also say orthogonal. We also say normal to each other. Um, it's easy to tell if the angle between the vectors is 90 degrees. It's also easy to tell if there's an acute angle between the vectors or an obtuse angle between the vectors because it's all a question of whether this dot product is zero, positive, or negative. If the dot product is zero, what does that mean? It means either A is the zero vector or B is the zero vector, or if neither vector is the zero vector, it means the cosine of the angle in between them is zero, which means it's 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians. Well, that means that A dotted with B is zero if and only if A and B are perpendicular. And I'll write what I've said before, perpendicular to each other, or orthogonal. It's also known as orthogonal. And normal to each other. You might go, wait a minute. What about the, when A or B are the zero vector? Yeah, we said the zero vector has every direction. So even if A or B is the zero vector, um, so that, that would make the dot product zero. Yes, they'd still be perpendicular to each other because the zero vector has every direction. Um, well, that's kind of cool. What if the dot product is positive? If the dot product is positive, well, this is, then this would have to be positive, positive, but this would have to be positive, which means the angle is between 0 and pi over 2 radians, but strictly less than pi over 2, but maybe equal to 0, which would mean the angle is acute. Right? An acute angle, so you get theta is between 0 and, I guess I'll write pi over 2 radians, but as I said, even mathematicians find it easier to think in degrees, you know, less than 90 degrees if it makes you happier. This is um, A dotted with B is positive, and theta is obtuse, so greater than pi over 2 and less than or equal to pi radians, all this is in radians, that's A dotted with B is less than 0, because the cosine for the dot product to be negative the cosine would have to be negative, um, which means that the angle's between pi over 2 and pi. All right, so here are these three vectors. So what's easy to check is whether the angles between them are 90 degrees, or whether the angles, so whether the angles are right angles, whether they're 
obtuse angles or whether they're acute angles. Uh, just this is called an acute angle, something less than 90 degrees. This is called an obtuse angle. You surely have heard those terms before, but just to remind you. All right, so it's easy. The dot product, you multiply corresponding entries and you add. So you get minus 2, minus 4, plus 6. That's 0. Um, so the A and B, so A and B are perpendicular. To each other. Their dot product is zero. Um, all right, that was easy. What about A dotted with C? A dotted with C is one, two, three, dotted with zero, four, one. You multiply corresponding entries and you add, so you get one times zero plus 2 times 4, plus 3 times 1. That's 0, 8, 3, this is 11. Right now, we will use the actual 11 in a minute when we really want the angle. But right now, what's important about 11 is it's positive. So the angle between A and C is acute. So the angle, I mean, right now we can say that the angle, I'll call it theta sub AC, it's greater than or equal to zero and less than, I'll do everything in radians. <coughs> There's an acute angle between A and C. And then the angle between A and B if all we care about is whether it's a right angle, an acute angle, or an obtuse angle, we'll just calculate the dot product, see whether it's zero, positive, or negative. The angle between B and C, so B dotted with C, is minus two, minus two, two, dotted with zero, four, one. That is minus two times zero plus minus 2 times 4, plus 2 times 1. This is minus 8 plus 2, so minus 6. So that's negative. So the angle between B and C is obtuse, so it's greater than pi over 2 radians and less than or equal to pi. All right, that you can do without a calculator. But if you actually want the angles, so we know the angle between A and B. It's 90 degrees, pi over 2 radians. But what is, suppose you really want theta AC and theta BC. And I'll just do theta AC, but it'll be instructive enough. What do you do? Well, it's the inverse cosine of A dotted with C over the magnitude of A times the magnitude of C. Okay, we already calculated A dot C, it was 11. So you get the inverse cosine of 11. But then you need the magnitude of A and the magnitude of C. So let me write A and C again over here where we can see them better. Uh, C is 0, 4, 1. A is 1, 2, 3. So what are their magnitudes? Well, it's the magnitude of A, it's the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. That's 1 plus 4, 5 plus 9. So um, 6, uh, <laughs> 14, 
Um, and then there's 0 plus 16 plus 1, 17. So you get the unattractive, the inverse cosine of 11 divided by the square root of 14 times the square root of 17. However, I have pre-prepared this. If you had a cal, at this point, anyone would get out a calculator. So if you want this in radians, it is approximately 0.777 radians. If you have a better feel for degrees, that's approximately 44.52 degrees, which is, is less than 90 degrees, so it's certainly acute, as we said it would be. Anyway, if you have to calculate dot product, uh, if you have to calculate the angles between vectors, this is what you do. You take the inverse cosine of the dot product divided by the, ma uh, the product of the magnitudes. Um, but yeah, if you actually want a number, most of the times you'll have to appeal to a calculator eventually. Um, okay. Um, An important thing to notice right now, we've, we have the standard basis in R2, in R3, and in fact, in Rn. You know, in R2, we have i and j. In R3, we have i, j, and k. It should be obvious to you kind of from the, the pictures that we've drawn of i, j, and k, but just to be clear, i in R3 is 1, 0, 0. J is 0, 1, 0. K is 0, 0, 1. Well, the dot products are all stupidly, I mean easily, 0. I dotted with J. I dotted with J. You just get 1 times 0 plus 0 times 1 plus 0 times 0. You get 0. And I dotted with K is 0, and J dotted with K is 0. All the dot products with two different standard basis vectors are 0. And in Rn, it's the same thing. What's more, the, the, the vectors themselves, if you dot the vector with itself, so you get the magnitude squared, you just get 1. You get 1 times 1, plus 0 times 0, plus 0 times 0. That's 1. It's the magnitude of i squared. Right? Remember, the dot, product, the dot product of the vector with itself is its magnitude squared. Its magnitude squared is 1, so its magnitude is 1. Of course, it's clear its magnitude is 1. So the standard basis in R2, R3, and in fact in Rn, the, the vectors in the standard basis for Rn are mutually orthogonal. So that means orthogonal in pairs, so perpendicular, normal, and all have magnitude 1. And it's not that we will use the general term that I'm about to say often, or maybe ever again, but it's worth saying once, um, a, collection of, a, base, a, a collection of basis vectors that are mutually orthogonal and all have magnitude 1 is called an orthonormal basis. Um, anyway, I, we shouldn't need that ever again, but... You should know the standard basis has this, pro has this property that the basis vectors are mutually orthogonal and they all have magnitude 1. Whether you remember it's called an orthonormal basis or not. Why is this of interest? Well, it, orthonormal bases are important more generally, but it also lets us calculate dot products using the i, j, and k notation or the standard basis notation and the algebraic properties. Um, So, as an example, let's just let's 
suppose we want to calculate 3i minus j plus 2k dotted with i plus j. All right. How do you do this? Well, one, one way, the way I don't really want to do it, is you write it, you write both vectors without the i, j, and k, and we just do what we've been doing. So I'll do this off to the side. But without the i's, j's, and k's, that's the vector 3 minus 1, 2, dotted with the coefficient of i, 1, the coefficient from j is 1. There is no k, so it would be a 0. So it's this, and then you multiply the corresponding entries. You add, and you get 3 minus 1, so that's 2 plus 0. So you get 2. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to have the i's, j's, and k's there, you do algebra as though the i's, i, j, and k are variables. And then, but where product is dot product, and then anytime you've got two different ones dotted with each other, you get 0. And if you've got the same thing dotted with itself, you get 1. So um, multiplication distributes over addition, and you can pull out the scalars. So you get this is 3 times i dotted with i. Um, I'm going to, so that was this dotted with this one. Um, and then you get plus this dotted with j. So you get plus 3 times i dotted with j. And then I'll move to this entry. Then you get minus, minus j dotted with i. Minus j dotted with j, and then plus 2 times k dotted with i, plus 2 times k dotted with j. And now the whole point is, yeah, dot products of two different standard basis vectors give you 0. So this term goes away because i dotted with j is 0. j dotted with i is 0. Dot product's commutative. Well, k dotted with i is 0, k dotted with j is 0, and then i dotted with i is 1, and j dotted with j is 1, so you get 3, three minus 1, you get 2. Of course you get the same answer, it's just a question of whether you like to treat kind of i, j, and k like they're variables and only at the last second use the dot products of i, j, and k, or whether you like to write things without the i's, j's, and k's. All right, um, let's use dot product to investigate orthogonal projection. So what is orthogonal projection? Well, so suppose you've got a vector f. I'm thinking of force, but it could be anything. And then I've got some non-zero vector, v. So v is not the zero vector. And what we'd like to do, actually let me make v shorter. So what we'd like to do is break f up as the sum of two vectors, one of which, this, hap this comes up for physical reasons. It comes up in physics problems all the time. So take a line that's parallel to V. What we'd like to do is what's known as orthogonal projection. So project perpendicularly onto this line. It's like you take a flashlight way up there and hold it perpendicular to this line and look at where the shadow of F is. That's why it's called projection and why it's called orthogonal or perpendicular projection. So if you project down orthogonally, so that's supposed to indicate a right angle right there. You'll get some scalar multiple of the vector v. So some, something parallel to v, a scalar multiple of v. We'll call that f sub v. And then you'll get this other vector, which would just be f minus f sub v, it would be normal 
to this line, so perpendicular to the line. And we'll call that F sub n. Here the V is a vector, so I've got this underline. N is just for normal, so don't have it underlined. And this is what we want to do, figure out a formula for this. Given F and given V, how do you find this piece of F? So this is called, this has lots of names. It's the component of F. parallel to V, or the orthogonal projection, or orthogonal projection of F onto V. And if you're calling it orthogonal projection, it's usually denoted in some way like proj for projection, sub v done to f. So the projection of f onto v. Um, this, sometimes this isn't given a name, it's just, oh, it's f minus the orthogonal projection, but it's also the component, it's also called the component of f perpendicular orthogonal, or normal, maybe I'll write normal since I'm writing F sub n, the component of the F normal to the Okay, and our <laughs> question is, okay, that's great. Is there a way, if you're given F in coordinates and you're given V in coordinates, how do you produce this component of F parallel to V? It's actually very simple. It's a Surprisingly simple. Once you've got that one, the, the other component, you just take your original F minus the orthogonal projection of F1 to V. So what we want, what we want, we want to write F as a sum of two vectors. F sub V and F sub n, where, well, we want F sub v to be parallel to v. So F sub v is t times v. And, well, F sub n needs to be normal to v. So F sub n dotted with v should be 0. So that's what we want to do. Well, you can just, you can do this now. <laughs> you can figure out what T has to be, right? The whole problem in figuring out what this orthogonal projection, this component of F parallel to V is, is figuring out what this scalar T needs to be. Well, it's easy now, because you write F equals TV plus F sub N, and you dot both sides with V. So over here, you get F dot V. Over here, dot product distributes over addition. You can pull out scalars. You get t times v dotted with v plus f sub n dotted with v. But we want f sub n dotted with v to be 0. Well, that tells us what t has to be. So this part is 0. And now you just saw this other part for v, uh, for t, you get t is f dotted with v divided by v dotted with v. v dotted with v is the magnitude of v squared, so you can write that instead. If you prefer, this is f dotted with v over the magnitude of v squared. So, if you can write f like this, what t has to be is this. Now that doesn't prove that this t does it for us, but it does, and you can check. So what we find is f sub v is, so this was just the scalar, so you have to multiply v times that now. It's f dotted with v over v dotted with v times the vector v. Or if writing things in terms of magnitudes, so this is the magnitude of v squared, we can write this as f dotted with v divided by the magnitude of v 
and then put a magnitude of V over here times V divided by the magnitude of V. This is our formula for the orthogonal projection of F1 to V. Um, F sub n is F, the original F, minus this. I'll say it again. What we showed was if you can do it, T has to be this. You really should verify separately that, oh yeah, and if T is this, um, we've done what we want. We've, that, that we've written this as um, a scalar multiple of V. Well, that's true because we're just taking this T times V. But you have to verify that F minus this times V um, is orthogonal to V. So you dot with V and make sure you get zero, but you do. And it'll look kind of like you're redoing this. Um, one thing to observe about this is here we have V divided by the, by the magnitude of V and V divided by the magnitude of V. That's the direction of V. It's the unique unit vector that points in the direction of V. And so it's clear that all we use V for is its direction. In fact, it's not even its direction. You can change it by a minus sign. You could take the opposite direction. Because if you change V by a minus sign, that will negate this and negate this, and you'll get the same orthogonal projection. This is supposed to be clear from the picture. Right? Back here in the picture, the reason I had V here and a dotted line was because all that really matters is this line that's, that's parallel to V. The actual that V was pointing in that direction doesn't matter. If V had been pointing in that direction, you get the same projection. All that matters is plus or minus the direction determined by V, so a line parallel to V. All right, um, that's the orthogonal projection. Um, it is, I prefer writing this F sub V notation, right, the component of F parallel to V, than explicitly writing out this projection notation. It's a little cumbersome. Um, to write this over and over again. This is actually much more useful if you're talking about kind of the projection operator and you're going to change the different f's that you put here and you want to give a name to the function of projecting onto v as you change f. But for a fixed f and v, um, I prefer this more compact notation for the component of f parallel to v. All right, um, let's calculate. And then we'll look at a standard use of, in physics, of the orthogonal projection. So, there's an example that I want to calculate. Example. Let's take F is 1, 2, 5, and V is minus 1, 0, 1. All right. Now let's calculate the orthogonal projection of F1 to V, the, so the, the component of F parallel to V, and the component of F normal to V, and let's add them and make sure we do get F back again like we're supposed to. Um, although, that will be kind of dumb. So the component of F parallel to V, we just decided formula for it, is F dotted with V or V dotted with V times V. Well, all of these things are easy to calculate. F dotted with V, this dotted with this. You multiply the corresponding components and you add. divided by V dotted with V, which is the magnitude of V squared, but you know, that doesn't really save you anything. It's magnitude of V squared, it's that squared plus that squared plus that squared, so you get, well, I'll just go ahead, one squared plus one squared, so you get two. And it's multiplied times V. So it's multiplied times minus one, zero, one. Um, you can, this is, this is five, plus 0 minus 1, so that's 4 divided by 2, it's 2. You get 2 times minus 1, 0, 1. So the claim is that this is the component of F parallel to V. How do you, how do you verify that? And for that matter, how do we decompose F as a, in terms of this parallel component and normal component? Well, 
the normal component is just f minus the component parallel to b. So it's 1, 2, 5 minus, all right, let me write this one out. This is minus 2, 0, 2. So we are getting 1 minus minus 2, so 3, 2 minus 0, so 2, and 5 minus 2, so 3. All right. And that's what we're calculating for f sub n. So we just calculated f sub n by subtracting f sub v, so it's completely trivial. I mean, unless I made some terrible algebra, some really ridiculous algebra mistake, that the original f is f sub v plus f sub n. It's the component of f parallel to v plus the component of f normal to v. But to check that we've done stuff right, and as a, the proof that I omitted when we were going through how you get the formulas, what you need to check at this point is, oh yeah, but is this really orthogonal to v? Right? That's what you need to check. Yeah, we produce, this one's certainly parallel to v, and certainly this one plus this one is v. Um, no, it's not. Did I? Uh, plus two. This one plus... Uh, I'm off by, there's a minus sign that's wrong. We get 2 times that minus, minus, I get 3. Um, 3 and, am I crazy? Um, oh, I'm looking at, pff, yeah, I was looking at V again, not F. Yes! <laughs> Certainly. This plus this is f. I was looking up here at v. You get 3 plus minus 2 is 1, 2 plus 0 is 2, and 3 plus 2 is 5. Yes. But is this really normal to what we started with? And the answer is yeah. To normal to v. 3, 2, 3 dotted with minus 1, 0, 1. You get 3 times minus 1, you get minus 3, plus 0 times 2, so plus 0 plus 3 equals 0. So yes, with this f sub v, which is clearly a scalar, a scalar multiple of v, so it's parallel to v, and this f sub n, the sum of these two is f, and this is parallel to v, this is normal to v. All right, why would you want to produce the orthogonal projection? And you know, where else does the dot product come up? Well, it has to do with work. We already looked at work. When you've got a force that is acting on an object in the direction of its displacement or in the direction opposite its displacement, so you have an object moving in a straight line, and a force that's parallel to the straight line, then the work is just the magnitude of the force times the displacement if they move, if the force is in the same direction as the displacement, and it's negative the magnitude of the force times the displacement if the force acts in the direction opposite the displacement. But what if an object, um, let me, what if an object undergoes a displacement from this point to this point and the force acts in some other direction? Then the question is, how much work? So this is now a force vector. And this is a displacement vector. And the question is, how much work so imagining some object that's displaced from this point to this point, how much work does F do on the object during its displacement? So of an object. All right. 
And the answer is that you only care about the component of the force that's in the direction of the displacement. So that all you care about here, you don't care about the part of F that's perpendicular to the displacement. What you care about, call this angle theta, is this, this component of the force. So F sub, which we've called F sub D. Drop this perpendicular. I guess I don't care about naming that theta. Drop this perpendicular. You care about this component of the force. And then you'd like to multiply its magnitude times the magnitude of the displacement. Because for an object moving in, in a line, you just take the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement. If the force and the displacement point in the same direction, and negative that if they point in opposite directions. So that means we want to take <coughs> the magnitude of F sub D times the magnitude of D if, if they point in the same direction. But that means this is so the work equals this if, well, pointing in the same direction um, would mean that their dot product is positive, um, or would mean, in fact, that F dotted with D is greater than or equal to zero, um, because that would mean that the angle is acute. So maybe I will call this theta. That would mean the angle is acute. And then when you project down, you would get something in the same direction. Or you get negative the magnitude of FD times the magnitude of D if F dotted with D is less than or equal to zero. So all that matters is this component of the force that's parallel to D. And then if they point in the same direction, the work is the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement. If they point in opposite directions, it's the negative. But What is the magnitude of what is the magnitude of this component of F parallel to D? Well, it's the magnitude. We had a formula. It's F dotted with D over D dotted with D times D. Right? That's what the component of F parallel to D is. It's that. But now we've got magnitudes everywhere. So this is the, the magnitude of F dotted. Or so, let's, let's see. so you get the absolute value of F dotted with D. This is absolute value. That's scalar. This is the magnitude of D squared. But then you'll get times the magnitude of D. So you get over the magnitude of D. So you can write this as the absolute value of F dotted with D over the magnitude of D. What is that? <laughs> the dot product. It's the magnitude of this vector times the magnitude of that vector times the cosine of the angle in between. Um, or actually, let me, not, let me not write that. You're getting, I won't, let's not refer to the angles. So you're getting this for the magnitude of the component of F parallel to D, but then you're multiplying by the magnitude of D. So this quantity is just the absolute value of the dot product. So this quantity is the absolute value of the dot product. By the same argument, this quantity is negative the absolute value of the dot product. But that means you get the absolute value of the dot product when the dot product is greater than or equal to 0. And if the dot product is less than or equal to 0, oh, you also get F dotted with D because you get negative negative. 
So what we conclude is that the work is given by the very simple formula. The work done by F during the displacement D is just F dotted with D. Well, that's very nice, assuming you're not given stuff in terms of angles, but you're given stuff in terms of components, because the dot product is very easy to calculate. So you, know, you can just do a, a trivial example. Suppose our force vector So an easy example, suppose a force of F equals minus one, three, two newtons acts on an object. as it is displaced from zero to five, everything in meters, to four, zero, minus seven meters. How much work? How much work? does F do on the object? Well, it's easy. It's just F dotted with D, which is minus 1, 3, 2, dotted with the displacement vector, which is 4, 0, minus 7 minus 0, 0.25. And then you just have to calculate this. Um, the answer will come out in joules. I'll do it, but it's not very difficult. So F dotted with D is minus 1 3, 2, dotted with 4 minus 0, so that's 4. 0 minus 2, that's minus 2. Minus 7 minus 5, that's minus 12. And so you get minus 4. So now it's the dot product. This times this, plus this times this, plus this times this. So minus 24. So minus... 34 units, joules, so the units of F times the units of the displacement. Joules, the minus sign, you might wonder, what does negative work mean? In general, negative work for motion in a straight line means um, the force is acting in the direction opposite the displacement. What this means, since our F was not in the direction plus or minus the direction of the displacement, means the component of F parallel to the displacement vector pointed in the opposite direction from the displacement. And that's why, that's why the work comes out to be negative. All right, that's, um, that's a quick introduction to the dot product, which we'll be using throughout the rest of the book. Um, orthogonal projection will come up every so often. We'll use that too. Angles between vectors. Anytime you want to find angles between vectors, unless you're trying to show they're parallel, and then you just want to show one's a scalar multiple of the other. Aside from that, Anytime you want to find angles between vectors, you want to use the dot product.